the task to talk about com a complete overview of data-driven decision making. To have really a complete overview, it's like you are the three-eyed raven. You, <laughs> you need to see everything. I, I'll, I'll try my best to be able to uh, do something, uh, get nearer to um, a complete overview. But if I don't get there, don't worry, there's a John Snow somewhere who would be able to. <laughs> uh, and I want to especially thank uh, Delali for this opportunity. It's, it's a rare opportunity to speak to lovely people like this about data. Uh, I'm still learning. Uh, forget about the eight years. It's, it's been bit and pieces of, of data, some different kinds of data at different levels in my life. Um, okay. I forgot that I had this. Okay, so everything in here you've already been told. Uh, the only thing that I want to point out here is that you see that I have very, very short relationships with com a lot of companies. It's a lot of them, I think, the, the most amusing thing is that I've had four years of marriage and that's way, way higher than any of the companies that I've seen. So it, it doesn't mean that I am very bad at relationships, yeah, if I've been able to. <laughs> uh, now, currently, um, my company is in Cape Town, and um, I work from Ghana. So you might be wondering how I work. The thing is that we, we can use different resources and ways of working together. So. Uh, And what they do is mobile money, simple, simply. So uh, domestic and international money transfer. Uh, they, they don't do that in Cape Town. As to why they chose to set up the operational headquarters in Cape Town, maybe for some of us who want to travel to South Africa to, to have the experience. But uh, the major operation is in Zambia and then uh, Malawi. Uh, what I do is basically pull the data, tell the CEO what uh, ca customers are doing and um, what they can do to get more revenue or try to uh, push customers to send more money to their loved ones across. Okay. So I'll try my best to um, talk about how companies, especially because I've spent a lot of my time here in Ghana and in different companies in Ghana, um, how companies have evolved back from my days at um, Nielsen and then the local research company and all that, and um, how personnel, the, the need for personnel and then uh, new positions that are coming up are evolving. And what are the kind, some of the problems that the companies are uh, solving? The only thing is that a lot of my conversation or a lot of my talk would be based around telco because I spent the largest, the longest uh, relationship with uh, the telcos. So once you spend a lot of time with your, your lady, you're able to tell your ex how. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, then we will talk briefly about um, big data definition. I think there are a lot of definitions around, but then we would pick some key uh, things and then concentrate on. And data analytics types and trends and data analytics framework. Uh, most importantly, we will spend some time talking about uh, some case studies from the uh, telcos. I put in sponsored data, but then I, um, I, I don't think we would have the time to, to go in that. Um, and then uh, we would have, so customer segmentation in, in telcos, we just spend some few uh, minutes to talk about that. And then chain prediction, which is some of the uh, uh, problems that as a customer analytics person in, in most of these companies you'll be dealing with. Uh, and some of the, all these 
they are mostly relevant when you are dealing with uh, service companies like the banks, the telcos, and uh, all that. So I was very glad when someone, uh, I, I looked at my slide and then I had a question around, did you, why didn't you put in a case study? So at least I have a case study uh, that you, you, you can have a look at. All right. I don't like questions, but then uh, I would, uh, I've created some five minutes for questions. If it's five minutes and I, nobody uh, asks me any question, I'm leaving. All right. So um, I'll start with a, with a story uh, back when I was at Nielsen. Uh, I was given a target of $300,000 to sell data. You are selling data back in 2012, and your target is $300,000. Not Ghana City, so back then. So I walked to this local uh, spirit company. I, I don't even know if, they still, if they've been able to survive. And uh, I told him that, you see, uh, I've got data that shows that you, you have one percent, like uh, just an example, one percent of the market share. Uh, you are in just about ten percent of the most relevant outlets that uh, sell spirits. And I've got the data on the the outlets that you can really go to, which would give you the best distribution and ultimately increase your market share. The man looked at me and said, "Massa." We've been doing this for the past so, so, and so years without any data. You want to come and sell me data for something that I'm already flourishing in and making a lot of money. The point is that he never understood what the potential of data and what it could eventually uh, give him. And so I got zero of my revenue, of my target from that man. Today, I don't think the... I hardly hear of them. They are not in anywhere around the spirit industry. And there, were, there was another spirit company that was buying data and all that, and they are still in the business. It, it's important that companies begin to realize what the value and how the bottom line is going to change for, for, for them. Um, previously, I mean, a lot of the companies that I've worked with, traditional research where you go paper and pen, you do, or, or now they've moved it to tablets, where you can go around and then uh, solicit people's opinion on how they are using, their de uh, how they are using your service and um, like their usage attitudes and all that. It was, it was the most relevant way of, of collecting uh, data on, on people. Um, Excel was really uh, the major tool that most, most people were using to analyze. And back then, Excel was uh, 65K rows with 256 columns. Uh, a lot of ha has changed. And uh, schools, I remember in my statistics class, uh, data analysis, we were not taught Python or R. We were taught some commercial um, software tools. Uh, I put it in there, but then. Uh. Now, the companies, I mean, competition has changed. You have um, an Adobe and by, by MTN, and then Tigo also has the same thing, uh, Airtel has the same thing. Um, everybody. Product differentiation isn't anymore the key. Now, price, if you price your, um, now a lot of people don't even care about how much uh, a minute, a minute uh, cost for, for airtime really is. And so the competition has, has, has changed drastically. And it means that you need to understand certain things before you can move above the curve uh, in competition. Uh, internet penetration, I'm very sure this figure has increased, but then um, I know it, it's around 34%, which means that about um, three out of every 10 um, people in Ghana are on the internet. And 
they are doing different stuffs like Facebook and uh, Instagram, which means that there, there's varied uh, data that's available for you to understand your customers very well. And uh, my senior brother, uh, John, uh, I mean, I just adopted him as my senior brother. So, <laughs> uh, and by the way, we, we also went to the same school. I mean, the only school in Ghana. So uh, I don't need to talk about it. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, the data in, in the telco uh, space, we've got huge data on customer calls, when, who, how, and who, like how often they call. Tons of data that is coming in. Back then, I, I knew that we were getting about um, close to. Uh, 10, 10 gig of data that was coming in on a daily basis, daily basis. So you can imagine over a month the kind of data that you'd be uh, receiving. Uh, POS systems are capturing where and what customers purchase. So when now a lot of people don't, I mean, the, the so-called elite, they don't want to be carrying money on them, but so they use uh, their cards to make uh, payments and um, purchases uh, online and even at retail shops. Uh, and so they capture what you're buying and um, uh, how much you are buying, where you are, you are spending your money and all that. So there's tons of data um, around POS systems. And then uh, I know uh, we've got companies around here, um, richest company, they, they deal in KYC optimization and uh, some long uh, I mean, long sentence about how they are using KYC to influence decision making. Um, we've got social media. Now Excel takes 1 million uh, rows, 16,000 uh, columns. And then R and Python is being taught in, on, on campuses uh, very uh, like frequently. You, you can also have access to R and Python uh, resources, just as we've discussed, very easily. Uh, all right. Now, but in the midst of all this, there are, there are key stakeholders that um, we need around, which is the CCU and top executives uh, champions. We've already discussed that here. It's very, very important if companies are going to adopt data and, and use data uh, mining uh, uh, solutions to improve on their comp competitiveness. It's important that these people, they are the ones that I put on top, the CCU and top executive champions. Uh, at at Tigo, I, I was fortunate to have a boss who was um, so much into data and he has so much power uh, when talking to the executives and the CCU. So whatever he said, they would listen to him because he was like, like some deep, deep man. Uh, it, so it wasn't very difficult for me uh, championing, um, I mean, how, uh, working within that environment. Uh, within. And then also um, training and networking opportunities like what we're doing here, it's important that uh, whenever there are opportunities like this for us to talk about data and to um, meet people who are like-minded, we take that opportunity and, and be part of it. Um, we also need a lot of experimenting. I think uh, as data people, when we get into the company, it becomes very difficult for us to show the value. But if we pick snippets of data and, tell, and show them that this is what the data can do for you and this is what I am getting, it, becomes, it makes the conversation very easier for them to understand. But if we just lip service to them and then uh, tell them that, you know, we, you need to get into data and all that. The data is there. Sometimes they are not using it for anything. But if you pick snippets of it, and then maybe in your spare time, you might not. We might all say that we don't have uh, time. Uh, there are so much demands around us. But if you really, really want to grow uh, data analytics and data science in your company, pick snippets of data that you you get a hold of. Make friends with the data warehouse guys and then pick some data and, and show the value to, to, to your immediate boss who would eventually uh, push it up for you. 
And lastly, it's all about business uplift. If they are not seeing the value that you are bringing on board, they wouldn't really buy into it. So if it is chain, I, I, I've talked about chain um, quite a lot. If I know that there might be a lot of people who do not understand uh, it. It's more like who, uh, who, who is living, who is stopping the service that I'm rendering. So that's, uh, in, in some industries, they would call it customer attrition. Uh, and then uh, we've got chain to mostly in the telcos. So who will stop using MTN or Tigo or Vodafone? Uh, and you need to be able to demonstrate that with your analytics and your uh, models, you, you are much more likely to cut down, say, chain by, by 20% or by 50%. Or you are you you can increase revenue by 10% uh, or 15%. Uh, if you don't talk in that terms, it becomes also very difficult because a lot of these marketing and CCU executives they believe in their guts. Like this is what I have learned from business school, and this is what we've got to implement. But you've got to show them that this data and uh, and this analytics that I'm doing. This is a, a return on investment that our, we will be getting out of it. They can pick it, experiment it, do it on some few customers. If it gives them the returns that they need, then you are, you are the star of your company. Okay, so uh, I'm not very good with uh, theories, and, and, uh, but then I'll try my best to, to explain some of these things so that we can move into the, the juice, which is, oh, okay. So big data, I think almost everybody sees it the way they want to see it. The, the engineers, the data engineers see it differently. The customer analytics person sees it differently. Um, I mean, the, the statistician, you know, now the statisticians are very, very um, aggressive now. They, they, they try to say that it's the same thing. Statistics is the same as data science. We are just um, commercializing the name so that <laughs> making it much more sexy for people to, uh, uh, to, to come into the field. But the point is that uh, it's, still, it's still numbers, it is, it's still statistics, so we should just keep it at that. So different people would have different um, uh, explanation on, on or the definition for uh, I, I just for, I picked this from from Mike is it Michael Bella um, because of some ingredients that I thought it's very important uh, so first is the scales we're talking about the scales we're talking about data we're talking about its iterative nature and then performance it's always important business performance. If you are not driving business performance, then it's not really data science or business analytics. And then the technology would come in and insight. Your insight must always drive business performance. That's the, that's the communication, that's the, the key communication that would, would, would make you relevant in any company. If you are not talking about bottom line improvement, then it's like you are in school doing some project work. All right, so I picked this from Davenport, and uh, that he shows different levels of analytics, and, and then the kind of business impact. So the analytics maturity is on the, um, is it? The down one is horizontal, right? Okay, so the horizontal axis, and then this one is the vertical axis, which shows the business impact. Um, when you are in the heroic stage, so it's more like spreadsheets, you are picking extracts and then analyzing it in Excel, uh, you think that actually you, you're doing something really, really great. And, uh, but the key thing really starts at the foundational level. And it, I'm very glad that uh, John started with, with that part, which is 
data governance, data warehouses, and master data management. This is the foundation. If you do not have these things, forget about what we're talking about. If a company does not build some of these things before they start talking about reusing data and the value of data and start, I mean, throwing out jargons around, it's not going to give us, a, like there isn't any headway. So it's important that once you begin to conceptualize the idea of big data and business analytics and all that, they should make sure that this foundation is laid. And then you can move to a much more competitive stage where they build OLAP cubes um, for people to slice and dice the data the, uh, whichever way they want, and then uh, build dashboards for um, companies. Currently, my, my, my job, all that I do is to build dashboards for the CEO for him to just look at. Uh, I, I don't do a lot of the modeling now. So, <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, then uh, for, for the, when you want to really differentiate, um, that's when you talk about uh, building uh, models around predict, like pre predictive models and uh, micro segmentation, uh, segmenting your customers, profiling them to understand uh, who is buying what, who is not buying this, who, who is using you as a, as a secondary SIM against who is using you at, as a primary SIM. Um, so who is the main chick and who is the... <laughs> All right. So it's, it's important that you should be able to um, understand the, the different segments within your, um, your, your customer base. Then, after doing all these things, the question is, and then what? So you understand your, your, your customer base. You know the segment. You know uh, that this person is likely to churn in the next few days. So what? So that's where the breakaway point, you know what to do out of data, comes in. And at that point, it's for serious mathematical people. It's not like... Some of the PhD people that John was talking about, this is where they, 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 might, they might be found. Uh, all right. So uh, it's broken into the descriptive, the, the lower part of it where we're doing spreadsheets and extracts and those things would give us a three, so the OLAP cubes and then the dashboard would give us uh, some idea around um, who our customer is. And then at the top level, what they are likely to do. And then uh, furthermore, we can talk about the prescriptive, uh, prescribe what needs to be done uh, for our customers. Um, this is another uh, chat, uh, basically expounding on what we talked about uh, earlier. So when, when we begin to crawl as a company, uh, that's where we do the standard uh, reports, the ad hoc report, and then we begin to really be on our feet when uh, people within the company can drill uh, data, slice and dice it any way that they want. If, if within your company now, you can't even pull data to look at how many customers you have, that's, that's, that's a non-starter. It means that you, you've, not, you've not even started. You, you get me? So you should be able to pull, summarize uh, data, and then uh, that, this is at the back of the, um, the data lakes and then the data uh, warehouses that we're talking about. So from there, you should be able to um, query anybody or like relevant people. If, if you are not using data in, in the company, I'm, I'm wondering what you are really doing there. You should be. <laughs> <laughs> you should be using data a lot, whether you are customer service rep or um, whoever. And then uh, sometimes some of these OLAP cubes can even um, strike alerts on, on what is happening um, with your customer, uh, who, is, 
who is buying more or who is buying less and all that. Then we move into uh, why is this happening? So first, what happened? How many or how often is it happening? Where exactly is the problem? What actions are needed? And then we move to a step further where we do the business analytics, is it? Which is, why is this happening? What if these trends continue? And then what will happen next? As in predicting what's happening next. Like you, you becoming a suicide as you say that this guy is going to uh, die in the next few days. So cut off his line. And then what's the best uh, that can happen? So understanding all these things, we want to under, uh, then go a step further to know that what can we do or what's the best option for us? And that's where the, the, the value really uh, comes in. Okay. So uh, there were times that you called a call center and people were very, very rude. Not anymore. It's now about the customer um, than the company. So it's, we are, companies are moving from selling what we can to what they need. And they must be able to understand what our needs are. So who is the customer? Uh, by understanding the demographics, demographics uh, purchases, community. So in, in telco, you, you, you know that you call about, say, uh, 20 people that you call very, very frequently. The 20 people also call maybe they have a, a group of customers that they call very frequently. You need to understand that network. So this is, it, it looks like um, the social network uh, platforms that we have, but within the company. And it's a very important metric to always look at, to understand who uh, the, this person is, um, is calling against, who is calling him as well. Um, so understand when do I buy or where do, where do I buy? So once you understand that I go to uh, Makola to purchase stuff, maybe I, I might not be in your target group, but you, it would give you an idea that, okay, maybe I should find a way that I can speak to this guy so that he can stop going to Cantamanto. <laughs> yeah, you can stop going to Cantamanto to pick uh, used used clothes to maybe start using uh, suits from from my end. All right. Then uh, for enterprise um, companies, the like the objectives, we want to understand who should I offer, and uh, that's where we do the micro segmentation and then the personalized. And then what should I offer? Um, offer allocation based on goal and constraints. So it's not everything that you can offer. The, the, the customer might need some very ridiculous stuff, but then your budget might not be able to meet that. So it's always important that you understand within your constraints what you can um, offer. And then when you should offer that. If, if I am going to, it's important because Google uses that a lot in um, when, they, when they talk about intention to purchase. So once I start searching for something, they know that, oh, this guy is likely to purchase this thing. At, and then they, they know exactly when to push me uh, that kind of deal. Um, and then how should I offer, um, so, which channels do you use um, your online presence or uh, your traditional settings to, to advertise to the person that you've got this product at this place and so you can uh, look for it. All right. Okay, so uh, in, in your job as the customer analytics person or the business analytics person, these are the key guys that you'd be working with. I know, it, uh, it's not very comprehensive. There are other um, um, uh, stakeholders like the uh, customer relationship manager. But then 
uh, key guys around product managers. These are guys that I mostly um, like interacted with. The product managers, the customer value management team, so which might be the customer retention Apple re uh, management team, and then uh, sales and acquisition team, and then the data warehouse guys. And trust me, sometimes the conversation can be very, very, very to toxic because a lot of people want to show that it's either they are working or, you know, and, and the data, we the data guys sometimes become the, the purveyors of uh, evil news. It's like this guy is not doing his work and so the numbers are not, doing, are not going right and then it, 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 it generates a whole lot of uh, conversation that's very, very difficult to manage sometimes. But uh, you, you should find your way around these guys, the product managers. If his product is not doing well, uh, you've got every right to tell him, but then you've got to find a way of, uh, I mean, managing their, their emotions as well. And the, so just to, if you, if you saw in my Tigo uh, uh, profile, I was the customer analytics manager and then I was building chain models and doing all that and I was bashing the, the chain manager. Why is, it, why, why is he not pushing uh, my models to make it work and all that he should, he should give them this product and all that. And then the next time I, I realized that I'd been pushed to manage chain. So I, was, I moved from customer analytics to manage chain. And that's when I really I appreciated some of the things that they go through. So don't just do the talking, sometimes you've got to be part of the process. And it was also a very good um, opportunity for me to understand the data side and the implementation side. Don't just give them the data and don't give them, just give them the, this is my model or that. You've got to be part of the process in, in making sure that your model works and then the, the the unit that you are working for also works. Uh, okay. So, um, I I'll take I'll take the the next few uh, minutes to talk about some of the of the of the case the cases that we, we dealt with during um, my time with the telco without giving so much detail, but then detailed enough to, to not, to evade a lot of questions. <laughs> All right. So um, there is this cross industry standard process that's always key when you start in a project in, in, in um, companies which is um, first you need to understand the business and uh, what, what, is the, what is the business trying to achieve. And a lot of the times my boss would say that if you want us to do something, you, you bring us a brief. It's different from when we sit down and say that, okay, um, Chain is increasing, or Apple is uh, Apple is average revenue per user, like revenue. Generally, the revenue that customers are making uh, is going down, and so you need to predict who is going to uh, be our most loyal customer or who is going to leave the the company. If it's coming from the product team or the CVM team, they would mostly bring you a brief that you can. Uh, have a discussion uh, together to understand what really they want to achieve. This is different from the, the team itself picking up the task of uh, building models just to um, drive business growth. Uh, and then once that is done, once you, you, you've passed the business understanding phase, you need to sit with the, um, with the data warehouse guys if you are not very familiar with the data warehouse, um, the, the different metrics that are being captured, you need to sit down with them, look at what is possible, what data that they have, and um, 
what you can get for, for your model. And it's also a very important stage in the business that you need to, uh, in the process that you need to undertake. Uh, and so it, it means that you should be able to communicate very well and be able to, uh, unfortunately for me, I was not very much of a, a talker. So sometimes my boss would, would do the, the, the talking. But then it's important that you, you, you engage the stakeholders at different stages in, of the project. And then the data preparation stage that uh, I think most, most of the time is spent at the data preparation stage where you are, you are trying to understand the data globally and then um, looking at building different um, variables to, to help you predict understanding um, all the different uh, parts of the data in a way that would help you uh, build the, the model. And this is, all this is iterative because once I, I build a model and then I realize that there is something that maybe is not right, then probably we need to go back to um, the data preparation stage to rework something that we, we didn't quite get over there. And then after modeling, the evaluation stage, if we evaluate it and realize that maybe we didn't really get the kind of results that we needed, then we will have to go back to the business owners or the product owners to um, understand, re rework the, the, the business problem uh, again. And then um, we can deploy. Now, for, for, for most of the work that we did, the deployment was more around either we creating new products or um, building frameworks to manage the customer. Right. Okay, so uh, I'll try to stay within this in the, in the case study and hopefully, um, so one um, thing that is very um, critical for businesses, customer segmentation. You need to be able to know the different segments and profile them. Uh, we do very well, I think, for, for the multinational companies, we do very well in uh, commissioning traditional research where they go and pick demographics of uh, a small group of of people like mostly either 2,000 customers spread over um, different places. The, the thing is that for those surveys, when it becomes very, very difficult, the, the people who are, who are going around picking the, the data will go and sit under a tree and fill the, the <laughs> and fill the survey for you. So it becomes difficult for you to rely on that data as your segmentation tool. Sometimes the best uh, mostly uh, some focus groups, but even people can come and sit in, at focus groups and lie through the, uh, I mean, they, they will lie to the extent that you think that they are, they are, <laughs> they are, they are the best people uh, in the world. But you see, for this kind of work that we do, using the raw data, there's, there's little chance, like relatively little chance that you, you might you would be getting it wrong. But even for this, for this project that we did, after we, had, after we had created the segments, we still went back to do focus groups on the segments to understand some, their psychographics and, and uh, what they do on a daily basis. So we are not completely wiping out traditional research focus groups and all that, but it's also important that once we, we come up with some of these things, we, we go to them and understand certain key, uh, which would help us in our marketing activities. Uh, so in, in the telcos, we, uh, there's churn and retention management, product development, um, customer acquisition, customer experience, and then uh, countering 
fraud. Um, I, you know, the, 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 if you've ever, I know there are people here who have, who have purchased data, huge buckets of data that they didn't buy from the telcos. You know, when, when, when you hear that some people have, uh, or someone is selling 100 gig of data for, for 15 cities, that's fraud at its highest level. So, <laughs> yeah. so these are some of the models that you need, to, you can come up with to know that this person is, is engaging in fraudulent activities. Uh, All right. So, uh, for for the customer segmentation exercise that we did, it was the the company already had segments based on what people had said about themselves, and then so they categorized them into whether you are a digital customer or non-digital customer, whether you are um, so plenty plenty names, but then they did not have segments based on usage behavior and and um, what they wanted to understand is that their current uh, product offering was it speaking to different customers within uh, their current user group and it's it's important to note that uh, sometimes the products that we create would eventually create the, the type of customers that we, we acquire. But if you do not know the kind of uh, customers you've acquired, then you wouldn't know how best to either to go to market to acquire your best customers or to uh, forget about those who are not, who are, whose return on investment is very low. So it's important that you understand your, uh, the ca kind of customers you've created based on your, uh, your product, and then redefine your product. Uh, and the business stakeholders that we, um, we mostly engaged with was the CVM, the product team, the marketing team, and then the data warehouse team. Uh, uh, then I think now it's, it's this is like uh, about five years ago, and the data was on about four million customers. So that's quite a, a huge data. Uh, we picked about 43 uh, variables, so uh, around data on reload patterns, product usage patterns, uh, community of incoming and outgoing calls, active and inactive days, like quite a, a, um, a number of uh, variables and then uh, conducted initial descriptive analysis on the 3.9. So descriptive analysis using um, on, on this 3.9 it's quite it's quite easy to do. The the most difficult aspect would be when you are trying to model on this 3.9 median. So first we needed to understand our general customer overview. And it's, it's one of the things that we need to do when you want to start any project. Understand your status quo, understand who you've brought in, and then you can go on to do all those kind of gymnastics with the, with the data. Then, uh, then, so after we did all those, we picked a sample of 100K uh, customers. Sometimes it's, 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 it's wise to pick that and then look at um, how it performs. And then largely also because we, we, are under, we were under-resourced. It, it was the first project that was being done around customer segmentation. So you need to be able to uh, show some results with some small data before you can go um, really huge. And so this is where I, I get into a little, a little bit of uh, statistics and those kind of uh, jargons. So uh, in, in 
a lot of the data that we have, you would realize that some are derived. Uh, uh, so if, if a customer calls uh, a lot more, you would realize that his revenue would be, it would be very high. So that would correlate the number, the minutes of call and then the, the revenue of the customer. You would also realize that um, his reload patterns would be very like frequent and he would load more often. Uh, you would realize also that he would be calling, it either he, he might be calling more people or he calls one person for a very long time. So a lot of the data was very um, like correlated and in, in some of the, a lot of the data that we have around, you would realize that only a few customers are doing so much activity. And then the masses, the, so in, <laughs> uh, the, the ones who, who recharge 50 pesos, and then <laughs> there are plenty. Yeah. Uh, but the ones who do the 10, 10 CD a day, uh, 20 CDs, so if, if, you, if you are doing 20 CDs uh, a week, uh, just know that you are, you are precious to the telcos and they should be giving you a medal. Yeah, all right. And so it, the data would be very, very skewed. Uh, you would have um, huge numbers som somewhere. Someone who is doing a thousand Ghana CDs um, a month against someone who is doing one Ghana CD um, and, and all these things, you've got to work it out so that it helps your model um, to not build in those biases. So we did some data transformation and then um, some principal component analysis, which I am not ready to uh, give a lecture on now. So you can, you can have a read around uh, principal component analysis and then uh, how to uh, some data transformation uh, analysis as well. You can have a, a look at them. And so uh, if, you, if you've used K-means, um, which also I am, I'm very sure once you get into the data science and building models and segmentation very well, you would learn. Uh, you, you would have to find a way of how many, uh, establishing how many segments that you, you want to, like the ideal number of, of segments. And there are different ways that you can go about it. But when we did it, we, we came up, we, we used the things that I've talking about, uh, I've, wrote, I've written up there uh, to to establish the optimal number of of segments. When we did it, we realized that it came up with three, and that's where you you would want to ask yourself: Is working with three segments really really good enough for 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 the company? And based on discussions that we had with the product owners, we, we played around with a number and finally settled on five. The point I want to drive with this is that, yes, sometimes the models would show you a particular direction that you've got to take, but it's always important to situate it in the business context. If business, if, if it does not make outright business sense, you've got to engage the stakeholders to look at what bandwidth of, of corrections that they would want to uh, take on so that you can have a very I mean, good business ready uh, project. So we, we settled on five and then we implemented K means. Uh, so the, we, we, we did a K-means uh, model, uh, which gave us the different, the five segments. Uh, I just want to give you a sneak peek of, of how we visualized and, and, and named, named the, the segments. So if you are sitting, maybe now they are, not, they are not actually using it, 
But if you are sitting here, know that you have a name. So the, the, the company would have named you as either um, an enthusiast or you are just a basic user or you are just someone who uh, they, they would want to offload of their network because you are not driving any revenue. So everybody has a name. Uh, you might not know, but then. Uh, and you see how this visualization, it's how you communicate Everything that we've talked about, the business, they don't care. It doesn't matter to them. Your K means, your old, it doesn't. What would make it very interesting for them is when they see things like this. Oh, okay. So I tell you that this group of people, they have a high uh, international uh, core activity, or, and then they have a very low inactivity day, days, and then they have above average on all other services. But this group of people, please don't really focus on them because they are moderately using, um, uh, using our services. They have longer days of inactivity. So probably they are just using you as a secondary sim. So just find a way of, of uh, either bringing them to a primary sim or um, you can decide not to spend any marketing uh, budget on them. So this, these graphs were the things that hit them the most. It's, it's never about uh, maybe the accuracy which is 90% or something, right? So this was the first um, thing. And based on this, so let me show you some of the actions that were taken based on there. So um, as I said earlier, we commissioned a qualitative research to further understand the psycho psychographics of the customers. Uh, and then the CVM team cleaned up. So they, they had tons of, of, of products, a lot of products, but based on this, they cleaned up the, the product offering to specifically focus on, on, on these uh, customers that had, uh, we, we had identified. And then um, liaised with the data warehouse team to develop ways to implement this on the larger customer base. And, and um, after Ghana did it, um, Chad and other uh, countries that were, did not have this segmentation model, we help them to implement it um, in the countries as well. Okay, so uh, case study number two, which is the customer churn prediction. Now churn is a very hot issue when you go to the telcos or even the service companies. Really, really hot, it can, like when conversations around those kind of things comes up, people, people become really like boiled up. So when you are dealing with issues like this, you, you've got to massage people's egos and uh, try to understand exactly what the direction of the company is. Uh, um, so first they wanted to understand who is, is living, who is stopping the service. And then, um, who is likely to uh, leave the service? Uh, identify if there were segments within uh, them, and then propose a product to win them back. So you don't just build the models and say, "Oh, hurry, I have a, a I have a model that's uh, seven, like 90 percent or 99 percent accurate." and that is it. You help them build the solution because you are part of the solution, All right? Um, and here it was the business stakeholders were the CVM, the CVM and products team, and then the data, data warehouse team. Um, so uh, I threw, it's quite a, a lot of text, but then I threw in this because in, in trying to build only 4%, so the data that we had, only 4% of the customers were churning. 
if you, if you don't build any model at all, you would be 96% right in picking randomly. This person will not change. This person will not change. And so you need to understand what cost of error the company is willing to take. And these are, this, is, this is a conversation you have with not just yourself and the data team, but the person who is going to um, design the marketing efforts and then the product owners. So there, were two, there are two different kinds of error, which says that I predict that this person is going to churn, and actually the person does not churn, right? So uh, that error against I predict that this person is not going to churn, and then the person churns. Um, these two, which ones were they likely, were they willing to, 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 to take on? It turns out that the, if you predicted that a high value customer is, is not going to chain and they chain, it's much more costly to the company. And so you build, you factor it in when you are building your model. The other bit too is that if the masses, the 50 pesos and the 20 pesos guys, if you predict that they are going to, um, they are, they, are, they are going to churn, and then they do not churn, you've wasted money, right? So there are two, these two metrics, the precision uh, where your true positives, the people that you say that they are going to churn, the ratio of that over your entire uh, prediction of, of, of positives. If, if that is very high, then you, see, you are very confident that, um, for example, the, 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 the high-value customers, you, you are not going to miss them. So for high-value customers, recall was, it was not accuracy. It was recall. Um, yeah, for high-value customers, true positives, uh, we're looking at how out of the positive results, how many of them, out of the positive situations that you have, how many of them did you get right? And, and that's what we wanted to accommodate. For precision, if, if you are not going to churn as a 50 pesos guy, we don't, want to, we, don't, we don't want to waste our time on you. So you've got to be right with the low, low level guys. All right. So these are, these are business cues that you need to discuss whenever you, you're having this kind of discussions. Uh, what error are they, like, uh, are they willing to take? And then you can proceed. All right, so the rest, so we built two different models, one for HVC, one for MVC and LVC. And um, different, I, I think my time is almost up, but then uh, data on, we picked this data on reload patterns, same as before. We held out recent two months data as test set, and um, yeah. So all these things, uh, different, different models that we, we applied different models to look at which one would give us the best um, performance in terms of what we wanted to look at. And one key thing is, as we've said, the community of customers was a major factor in predicting chain. If the person had a very small community uh, that were calling him or uh, receiving calls from him, then uh, he's likely to chain. And based on this, we created a chain and retention uh, framework with relevant product offerings. And then I uh, also, con so there was this product that we built if we know that you are going to change, then uh, we give credit to your, your most called uh, person. And then the person will use that data to call you just to activate you. you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we, we won't give it to you because you might not see it, but then we give it to your, your other person who would see you. All right.
So, Dan. Uh, <laughs> okay.